Hello. So today we're going to be talking about Menander's play Epitrapontes, or The Arbitration. Um, so, like Samia, which I, I've done a, a video on before, and you should be seeing the link for it in the top corner there, uh, Epitrapontes is largely lost. There's maybe about half of it that survives. Um, so, the entire opening of Act One is mostly lost. Uh, the bits of Act One that survive are largely speculative. Act Two is mostly gone as well. Uh, the end portion of Act Three is gone. Um, both the opening and the ending of Act 5 are mostly gone. So, and then within the, the stuff that remains, there are portions that are lost. So, even though act, most of Act 4 is relatively intact, there are still, um, in some cases, 10, 20 line, 25 line sections that are missing. So, again, this is one of the, the challenges with Menander, is that so much of these plays is actually lost. Um, and so when you read them in something, for instance, like this Oxford World Classics edition, um, the, so they, the editors here have done a really good job telling you when things are speculation, telling you when, to a certain extent, whose speculation they are, like different classicists and, and scholars who have attempted to fill in bits and pieces, but you're missing large portions of the plays. Like, Epitropontes is not really a performable text at this stage. Um, and so that's one of the big challenges with Menander. That being said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a sort of overview of the plot because um, unlike something like say Oedipus the King or uh, Lysistrata where a lot of people have read it um, not that many people are necessarily going around reading the fragments of Menander. So uh, Epitropontes the story uh, revolves around Charisios and his wife Pamphile. Um, Pamphile has had a baby about four months after uh, she marries Carasios, which, if you know anything about uh, human reproduction, is not the normal amount of time that it takes to gestate a baby that uh, you would have conceived on your wedding night. So, uh, Tarasios is pissed, and he goes uh, to stay next door with his friend Chariostratos. Um, so, what? Okay, um, slight clarification there. Um, Tarasios was out of town when the baby was born, so uh, he wouldn't have known about it except his servant, Onesimos, uh, told him on the logic that if uh, Charosios later found out uh, and, and uh, learned that his servant had not told him this uh, fairly important piece of personal news, um, Onesimos would have been uh, severely punished. Onesimos seems to go through most of the play concerned that whatever course of action he takes, it's going to get him punished and trying to avoid that as much as possible. So, uh, Charosios has gone next door, essentially abandoning his wife, um, and he has taken up with uh, Habra sorry, uh, Habratonin, who is a flute girl from the brothel, or, sorry, uh, a harp girl from the brothel. Um, she is some kind of uh, a prostitute like it's not 100% clear uh, somewhat like crisis in Samos 
it seems like she is what was called a hetaria, which were um, either sort of upper class prostitutes who uh, specifically went to symposia in order to uh, entertain men not only with sex, but with um, poetry, music, uh, the knowledge of philosophy, rhetoric, whatever it was. Um, so more like a contemporary escort, I guess, than like your sort of standard uh, streetwalker type prostitute. Uh, so it seems like Habretonon is is more in that vein. Um, Smikrines, uh, who is Pamphile's father, uh, Charisios's. Uh, Charisios' uh, father-in-law is not particularly keen on this turn of events where his daughter has been abandoned by her husband uh, and so Smic uh, Smicrinus basically spends the entire play trying to get the dowry back and get his daughter to go home with him uh, which uh, Pamphile, uh, Pamphile does not particularly want to do. So what had happened, because again, uh, Pamphile uh, had this baby when Charosios was not at home. Uh, she gave the baby to a servant to go drop off in the woods or wherever it is that you go to dispose of babies that you don't want in ancient Greece, which is a thing that happens all the time in Greek literature, Oedipus probably being the most famous example. Uh, the baby is found by a shepherd. Uh, and the shepherd, so the shepherd, when we first see the shepherd in the fragments that we have, he's arguing with a guy named Cyrus, um, and Cyrus is a charcoal burner who happens to be a charcoal burner for, uh, Cariostratos, who was, again, uh, Charisios's friend that he is staying with having run out on his wife. So what we learn uh, in this argument is that uh, the shepherd found this baby with some jewelry. Now that's highly significant because uh, the jewelry conceptually can help identify this baby. Uh, the shepherd realizes he doesn't really want a baby, so uh, Dao, or Cyrus, uh, who's the charcoal burner, convinces the shepherd to give the baby to him. Then he goes back to the shepherd uh, and he says, well, now I need all those jewels that were found with this baby, all this, ju all this jewelry, these rings and things like this that were found with this baby because they're the baby's possessions. And so if, if we... And so basically what happens... Uh, Smikirnes, who, who's just sort of randomly there complaining about his daughter being run out on, gets sort of roped into arbitrating this discussion, and there's a debate between the shepherd and the charcoal burner. Uh, the shepherd basically says, I found this baby and these jewels. I should get to keep at least something. Um, and, and Cyrus, the charcoal burner, who now has possession of the baby, says, well... If it were just a find and, it, and they didn't belong to anybody, then you would be within your rights. But because this jewelry belongs to the baby and could conceptually help identify whose baby it is, if you keep them, you're stealing from this baby. And so I, uh, Cyrus the charcoal burner, am coming to speak on behalf of this baby. Um, Smikirnes agrees. And so uh, the jewelry is handed over. But as that's happening, uh, as, as Cyrus is going through the jewelry, uh, Onesimos, the servant of Char Charisios, uh, recognizes the, the ring that the baby has as his master's ring that he had lost previously, 10 months or so previously, whatever it was, uh, at a festival. Um, so Onesimos takes possession of the ring, convinces 
convinces Cyrus to help him figure out if the baby belongs to uh, his master or, or is the son of his master, the child of his master. Um, and so they come up with a plot. Uh, Habertonen gets involved in this plot uh, because she uh, she was at the festival where uh, Charisios lost his ring and so she remembers that he raped this woman. Now this all gets treated very lightly because this is a comedy and because in ancient Greece rape was not uh, necessarily regarded as that serious a matter. So this, this, the whole plot here at this point takes a really kind of fucked up turn. Um, so Habertonen agree, she comes up with a plan where she's going to pretend A, that it's her baby, and B, that she was the one who was raped at this festival to confirm that Charisios was the one who did the raping. Once she's confirmed that, the plan is then to go find the baby's actual mother, the person who uh, Charisios raped at this festival. Which So that goes according to plan. Um, at which point, uh, Habertonen is just sort of out on the street or whatever, uh, and Pamphile comes out and... Uh, um, Habertonen recognizes her as the woman who was raped at this festival because, again, Habertonen was there. Um, and Pamphile is like, yeah, that was, that was me. And also I recognize that jewel on your baby. So this is actually one of the things I, I did want to talk about because we've got this very uh, conventional recognition scene. Um, and this is in uh, Act 4. So we've actually got most of this still. Um, Pamphile is out just in the streets. She says, won't any of the gods take pity on me in my misery? And it's not 100% clear here whether she's talking about her uh, devotion to Charisios and, and his sort of running out on her, or whether she's pining for her, her baby that she thinks is dead because she's exposed it. Um, and so Habertonen says to the baby, when will you see your mother, darling child? But, and then she sees Pamphile and she says, but look, who's here? Pamphile says, enough of this, I'll go, and starts toward the house. At which point Habertonen says, wait, lady, for a bit. Pamphile says, you're calling me? Habertonen says, I am, please look at me. Pamphile, you know me, lady? Habertonen, as an aside, says, this is the very girl I saw. And then to Pamphile, she says, darling, hello. Bit, bit weird of a, a greeting if you're the prostitute who's taken up with someone's husband uh, after he's, he's abandoned her wife, but that's my editorial commentary. Uh, Pamphile says, but who are you? Habertonen says, come here, give me your hand. Now tell me, sweetheart, did you go last year to watch the Tower of uh, Polia with friends? That's the, type, the name of the festival, by the way. Uh, and Pamphile suddenly recognizes one of the tokens. So this is, again, a very sort of standard type scene, a standard type recognition scene where uh, through some kind of token, through some kind of physical marker, someone recognizes someone else. And she says, where, lady, did you get the baby you are holding? Tell me. And so we have we go from there. Basically, they work out that uh, Pamphile was the woman that uh, Charisios raped at this festival. So therefore, he's the father of her baby, again, the baby that she had abandoned, and that Habertonen now has possession of. So Pamphile gets her baby back. Uh, Charosios is informed that it actually is his baby, and everybody gets to live happily ever after because uh, Charosios goes back to live with Pamphile, who is both his wife, wife and his rape victim, which is apparently a happy ending.
Yeah, I mean, so it, it, that's a really like that's a very difficult thing um, in in terms of modern sensibilities. Like, you would not find that in modern comedy. I hope, uh, at least, not most modern comedy. But that idea um, was actually not that problematic to the ancient Greeks necessarily. So there's that. Um, but the other thing I, I want to I want to just touch on very briefly. Uh, is this debate between Cyrus the charcoal burner and the shepherd um, because when they first sort of buttonhole uh, Smikirnes to, to arbitrate this he said Smikirnes says blast your impertinence you skiv around in working clothes while arguing your case so he's sort of denigrating their their likely ability to command rhetoric uh, and Cyrus says very eloquently, uh, but all the same, it won't take long. It's a simple case. Grant us this kindness, sir. Please don't despise us. When disputes arise, justice should always triumph everywhere, and everyone who's there should feel concerned in this. It is a duty shared by all. And so this I, to, strikes me as a really important thing because, as I've talked about in a number of other videos about Greek drama, that ability to speak freely to to use rhetoric to persuade your fellow citizens was actually a cornerstone of Greek democracy and it's really interesting that it's showing up in this play by Menander because uh, Menander is writing in the fourth century rather than the fifth century so we have the, the big canonical four um, Aeschylus Sophocles Euripides and Aristophanes writing in, in the 5th century at the height of Athenian democracy. Menander is writing after the main Athenian democracy has collapsed and Athens sort of switches back and forth between um, a tyranny and an oligarchy. Uh, it gets conquered obviously by uh, the Macedonians and so Greek democracy is not the central thing that it once was. And yet, in this play, in, in the fragments that we have, we're still seeing that sort of appeal to rhetoric, that appeal to persuasion that's so central to democracy in ancient Greece. 